Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. What's the first word that Paul uses in verse 3? Grace. This is not just your amenable salutation. This is the central motif of the letter of Galatians. God's grace. Paul's entire life and ministry had been changed by God's grace. Paul had gone from a very religious Pharisee practicing self-salvation to a man who had been changed by God's grace. Paul even says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. If you have your Bibles, you can look down there at verse 13. He says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. You see, religious people strive to break down instead of build up. Religious people strive to discourage rather than encourage. And Jesus had to make a return trip from heaven back down to earth to convert Paul on the Damascus road. And he changed him by his grace. Paul had been bound by cumbersome chains of religion. Jesus, however, came to deliver him from those chains of religion and from the present evil age. Jesus shattered those chains of religion for Paul and God's grace transformed his life so much so that he goes off and he preaches three missionary journeys. And what does he see as he preaches the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ unto salvation? He sees people from every tribe, language, nation, and peoples being changed as well, being converted, being born again to a living hope. And it's amazing what the gospel of Jesus Christ will do to religious people. And Paul is a prime example of God's grace changing someone from knowing a lot about the Bible to knowing the person behind the Bible, having a personal relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. There are two things I want you to see this morning from this text, and it's pretty easy. Number one, he says, deliver. It's right here in your text. Deliver. Number one, deliver. But this deliver leads to doxology. Deliver, doxology. Just two simple points. Have you ever noticed how I never preach three-point sermons? It's too much information for me. I went to public school. Pray for me. Two points is enough. Number one, deliver. Take a look at verse four. Let's go back to the text. It says, Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. What does Christ Jesus do? He gives. He gives and he gives and he gives. The Greek word there is didomi. It literally means to sacrifice, to give up and to do without. But he didn't just give up treasures and resources. He didn't give up just expendables. He gave himself. We can't get too far in this passage and in this book without seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ again because God so loved the world that he took. No, he gave. He gave. He's a giving God. He's a generous God. He's unlike every other God of the world's religions. Allah says, I'll take and I'll take and I'll take. You better work the fivefold path. Hinduism is the same thing. You better live a good life because you're going to be reincarnated. I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm taking. You have to work, work, work. The God of the Bible says I'm generous, I'm gracious. I work on a different system. I have a different paradigm than all the world's religions. And here, the God of the Bible came down in Jesus Christ, was born of a woman, went through the birthing process. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Jesus is what? Very God and very man. And in his humanity, he had to grow. We do not want to commit Apollinarianism, which was a heresy in the early church, where it said that Jesus just had a divine mind, that he really didn't have to grow. No, he cannot be our Savior unless he is like us in every way yet without sin. Well, what did he sacrifice? Go back to the text. It says for. Just stop there. We can't get any further. Huper is the Greek word. For. In behalf of. He sacrificed himself for. The wages of sin is death. 
And Jesus substituted himself in our place. We deserve death, but he died so that we could have eternal life. And that little Greek word, huper, for, radically alters and recreates all things. Huper recapitulates all former blessings that we had in the garden before our first parents and ourselves sinned against a holy and righteous God when we were kicked out from that garden. And he came to die for, in behalf of. You remember what happened when they got kicked out of the garden? God puts a cherubim with a flaming sword so that no one can enter the garden ever again. And what does Jesus do? He tells that cherubim to sheath thy sword. Put it away. Because the sword's going to fall on me and not my people. There's a new entryway into God's garden, and it's only through Christ. And here he says he died for our sins. In theology, we have an acronym for this. It's called PSA. Yes, it has nothing to do with your prostate. Some of you are old enough to laugh. If I were at a younger demographic church, I wouldn't say that. PSA stands for Penal Substitutionary Atonement. Penal. He took the penalty for our sins. He's a substitute. He stands in our place and for our sins. And atonement is this umbrella term which has two big terms underneath it. Propitiation and expiation. He died for our sins so that he took the wrath of God. He mollifies the wrath of God. This is propitiation. And it has to be propitiated because the wrath of God will fall upon the due penalty of those who have sinned against him. And Jesus propitiates the wrath of God. He turns it away. He placates it. However, there's also another term. It's expiation. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is expiation. He removes it. He takes it far from us. This is such an amazing atonement that Christ has done on our behalf. And when Paul says for, it's loaded. You see, many times we read right over this word, who pair. But throughout church history, there are volumes and volumes written about this. There's so much ink that's been spilled about this one word, for. Why? Because if you want to know the gospel, it's for. For. One little word, for. He died for our sins. What a Savior. Not a God who says, work toward me. Work toward your nirvana. Work toward your heaven. But I will enter into this world. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to do something on your behalf because you're inept. You can't do it yourself. You need God to do something for you. God takes the initiative. We're unable. You know, we don't really embrace this, though, unless we see the severity of our sins. When's the last time you felt the weight of your sin? You were burdened by your sin. You were downtrodden by your sin. Maybe you were like Nehemiah who sat down and wept and mourned for days. Maybe over your sin, but also the sins of your people. The sins of your nation. Too many times we have pride that puts a filter over our sin. And here he says he died for our sin. If God had to come in the flesh to die for our sins, then we should put a greater emphasis on our sin and not pass over our sin lightly. Many times we can go to a church and we can listen to a sermon or we can go to a church and we can take the Lord's table and never really hear about our sin but if our sin is that heavy, if our sin is that burdensome, that God had to come down in the flesh to do a rescue mission, to deliver us, then we should take time to think about our sin, where we have fallen short this week, where we have said things we should not have said to one another or maybe behind the backs of other people. James says this ought not to be so. Out of one mouth flows blessing and curses. We bless our Savior and God, and with the same mouth we curse those who are made in his image and likeness. 
Are any of you guilty this morning for cursing those who are made in God's image and likeness? Guilty. 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 Fortunately, it says here that he died for our sins. Go back to the text. Take a look at this. It says, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. Circle that word deliver. You can do it there in your bulletin if you don't want to write in your Bible. Deliver. What does it mean? It connotes that God chose a people to free from slavery. It's what it means to deliver. It's what the Greek word means, to deliver. We find this exact same Greek word in Acts chapter 7. Stephen stands up and preaches a covenant theology sermon. And as he gets to the end of it, in Acts chapter 7, verse 34, he's talking about what the Lord did on behalf of the Hebrew people that were in Egypt. And the Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groanings. And I have come down to deliver them. The Lord chose a people to set free from slavery. Paul said God in Christ chose a people to emancipate. This is the gospel of the emancipation proclamation of slavery. Slavery from sin. This is a time for celebration even as we read these words. But it was a time of celebration for these early Christians. Christians who had been pagans, who had been Gentiles. Paul went to the churches in Galatia. He preaches the gospel. People are coming to faith in Christ. They're changed. And they heard this message of emancipation, free from slavery. They knew because God had placed in their heart that they were sinners. Their consciences bore witness to their sinful behavior. Paul says you've been freed through Christ. He's delivered us. Delivered us. You see, this is the gospel. It's what God has done to deliver us, not that we could deliver ourselves. Today, we're trying all kind of technological advances. Elon Musk is trying to get us to where we can go live on Mars because he says this world's going to burn up. He's right. This world's going to burn up. We're screwed, royally screwed. But it's going to burn up when God in Christ wants it to burn up. And that burning will be a refining of this earth like refiner's gold and all sin and sorrow and tears will be taken away and it will be a new heaven and a new earth where Christ is the sun shining forth every single day but how does that all take place first and foremost because he came to deliver us. He chose a people to himself. People get really bent out of shape about the doctrine of election. You shouldn't. It's God's doctrine. It's from God's holy word. And it's not meant for pride. It's not meant to be braggadocious and look at me and beat my chest. And I'm one of God's chosen people. Look at me. I'm so amazing. No. He chose you out of sheer grace. Not because of anything we've done. And he did this before the foundation of the world, before you were ever knit together in your mother's womb, before he ever created you, before you ever took one breath, he already had picked a people out through Christ to redeem to himself and to deliver them from what? We'll go back to the text. From the present evil age. Paul did not say out of this present evil age. He says, look closely, from the present evil age. The Bible is always true. God needs no interpreter. He interprets himself. And in John chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus said, we're the salt of the earth, the light of the world doesn't save us and then rapture us out of here so that we have nothing else to do. He doesn't ask us to go be a monastic and 
escape from this world and have nothing to do with this world, I'm sorry, you're a human being. You will live in this world in as much as you're able to try to get away from the sin of this world. Think about Noah. He got on the boat with his family. What got off the boat with Noah? Starts with an S, ends with an N. It has one vowel in between. I'm trying to help you out here. Sin. Sin got off the boat. Oh, but he got off and he went out to a place to plant a vineyard and they lived far away from everybody. They had their own compound. So did David Koresh. What was there? Sin. Sin. We can try to escape from everything. We can try to remove ourselves from everything. Jesus says, no, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Paul actually says, you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, and yet you still live in this kingdom of darkness. But you're a city set on a hill. Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. We've been delivered from this present evil age. Remember before you were a Christian? Do you remember that life? That former way of life? And if you can't remember that former way of life, you'll never have a heart of compassion to reach out to others who are not Christians. Do you remember what it was like to be walking in darkness? Living life for only the material things that were passing away. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image, there's that doctrine of image again, image of, of God. He's delivered us from sin and Satan. Sin no longer has dominion over us. Yes, it still takes up residence. We still have sin. None of us will be perfect in this life. But he came to deliver us, to set us free from the chains of sin and from being blinded by Satan. That's what happened to our first parents. They were blinded by the God of this world. It was God or the fruit. Eve says, I'd rather have fruit. God's not that great. And how many times a day do we do the same thing? Ah, I'd rather have fruit than God. I'd rather have material things than God. I'd rather have this thing than God. And we all do falling incredibly short each and every day. But why did Jesus die? Go back to the text. It says, for the will of our God and Father. There's the gospel of grace again as Paul starts this letter. It's because of God's will, not because of our will. We weren't searching for God. He came. He chose us. And before the Holy Spirit calls us anyone to be born again, we only choose one thing. We choose sin and sin repeatedly. We are sinners, yes, by nature and by choice. But God in his infinite wisdom and in his will and his decree, he causes us to be born again. Born again from the dead, dead in our trespasses and sins, but he causes us to be born again by his own will, not because of ours, not because of your family, not because of good friends, but because God said, you're mine. Daryl, you're mine. You're mine. Not because of anything you've done. No, you've done terrible things, but you're mine. And I'm going to draw you to myself. And I'm going to deliver you from sin. I'm going to deliver you from the slavery that you've been living in. Praise God that he would do this out of his own sheer will, not of ours, because we would have never chosen him. That's what Jesus says. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Praise the Lord that he chose us. And that is a doctrine that humbles us. Not a doctrine that builds us up to say, we're so amazing. It's a doctrine that says, he's so amazing that he would choose a ragtag bunch of people like us. 
How many of you think that you're a blue chipper in the Christian faith? Don't raise your hand if you think so. Because you just committed sin. See, here's the problem. We want to identify and get acceptance from the things of this world. And especially even in the church world. We want to have acceptance by the church we attend. Did you, did you know the church we go to? They actually meet in a gymnasium at Due West United Methodist Church. What's the name of the church? Gospel Reform. Never heard of it. I have no idea. Today when I preach at the back of the you know what's going to happen? Hey, where are you, Pastor? Uh, Gospel Reform Church. Uh, huh? Where, where's that? Uh, we're in a small hole in the wall. Would you like to join us? It'd be great. But what we typically do is, look at this church. I sit on the corner of so-and-so. We're huge. We're massive. We're amazing. Look at us. Jesus says those who would put themselves first will be last. What we see is a great edifice. What we see is the great, magnificent things of this world. And we identify ourselves with, oh, well, I know these wealthy local people, these highfalutin people. Yes, I said that term. My wife hates when I say that word. It makes me sound old. But we try to identify and we try to drop names, right? It's all about this person. Well, we know in so-and-so. <laughs> He's the uh, real wealthy guy there in Marietta. Does that save him? Does that really give you a right standing before God? No. No, nothing in this world gives you a right standing and acceptance before God. We want to be accepted. We want to be in that certain friend group, don't we? How many of you have been excluded from the certain friend group? And we're trying to always get into that friend group because if we can just be in that friend group, we'll be great. We'll be amazing. We'll be somebody. But when you ever actually get into that friend group, you realize they're a bunch of lousy people who've been saying lousy things about each other. There's only one that you need to worry about, that you need to place your faith and trust in to accept you. And that's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. If he's the one who has said, well done, good and faithful servant, if he's the one who has justified you, you need nothing else. And that will make you humble and not prideful. You'll be able to interact with other people who are made in his image and likeness and not be snooty or look down upon other people. You will be humble and well-receiving of others because you were saved by sheer grace. Where does this deliverance lead us? Well, if you go back to the text, it actually takes us to doxology. Go back and look at verse 5. It says, To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. How does Paul conclude this opening section? Gospelology leads us to doxology. I just made that word up. Gospelology leads us to doxology. Yes, theology, protology. Soteriology, eschatology, all these things that point us to the triune God and his great work on our behalf, which could be encapsulated under the umbrella of gospelology, can only lead you one place, and that's it, and that is to doxology, to praise. Paul says, rejoice! Again, I'll say, because the Philippians didn't have it, did they? They hadn't figured this out. They were Christians, were saved by grace, but, you know thinking about this and this didn't happen the way I thought it would and this still needs to happen and I'm really angry about that and he says rejoice again I will say again he has to say it again why because we as Christians need something called multiple exposures to the gospel can you believe that even though you came to Christ you can still have Eeyore syndrome because you haven't remembered the gospel of Jesus Christ you're still trying to find your acceptance from the things of this world we need something from outside this world. And this gospel of being saved by grace, of being delivered from this present evil age, sends us off into, well, it sends Paul off into doxology. To him, to him be the glory. To whom? For the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you don't desire doxology, you may still be dead in your sins and trespasses. It's just my disposition. I'm a Presbyterian. I like to purse my lips when I talk too. No. We have some of the greatest doctrine on the planet. Some of the most dead people you ever meet. Why? 
Because the gospel hasn't ignited our hearts. Our heads, but not our hearts. After the service is over, I want you to pay a visit to our astute resident theologian, George Goddard. And just ask him about the Lord. But you better have 30 minutes to spare. Because he's going to talk about the Lord for a while. Oh, and if you're feeling kind of dead in your trespasses and sins, just sit on this side of the room next Sunday, or you can move after we go to sing here in a minute, and sit next to, I don't want to call him out, but he's over here. If you sit next to someone over here, you're going to hear him sing. And you can't help but want to sing the praises of God when you hear him sing. I stand up here every week and I get to hear him sing. It makes me want to sing. Sing, rejoice, I will again, I say again, rejoice. Paul gets led to doxology because of why? Because of gospelology. What is Paul's first word that he uses in verse 3 to start this letter to Galatians? Grace. Grace. It's all about God's grace. And you say, you're just a hyper-Calvinist. That's all you want to talk about. No. Grace changes everything. I would say you haven't gone far enough in God's grace. Go further. Augustine said when you look over the corner of the deep recesses of a canyon and you can't see the bottom, he said God's grace is even further down. Keep going. Paul was changed by God's grace because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had engineered and engendered the gospel before the foundation of the world. And that's why Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 1 verse 2, he says, God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. What an amazing gospel. We're justified by faith in Christ alone. And the gospel is you're justified before the trial ever takes place. There's coming a judgment day where all men will have to stand before the Lord and give an account for what they've done in the body, whether good or evil. And if you're in Christ Jesus, the verdict has already been rendered. He took the condemnation. He took the wrath so that we could be accepted. If you're here and you're not a believer, I would invite you to come forward and talk with me after the service. I would love to discuss this with you because there is a day coming for that judgment. And I and we do not want you to taste the wrath of God. We want you to already have an assurance today to know that the wrath will fall and has fallen upon Christ. And this does not lead to loose living, as some Christians will say. This leads to love. Love for what your Savior has done on your behalf. He has died for us to deliver us from this present evil age. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray.